streaming from Liberty Christian Church in Madison, Indiana. Welcome. So glad you could join us online. Um, good to see all of you. I send greetings from Brenda and uh, Terry Parker at Summit Theological Seminary. I was up there today. I spent the night last night up there with Dad. Uh, I would ask for your continued prayers for him. Um, he has declined. Uh, he hasn't been able to swallow um, food since last Friday. And uh, he's not really there uh, as far as being real conscious. Every once in a while, sort of come to. He doesn't really know what's going on. And uh, sleeps most of the time. Normally pretty comfortable, though last night he had a couple hours where he was agitated. Um, he could use your prayers. Never thought I'd pray that my dad would die, but I have been for his sake. Um, so some of you probably have gone through this and know what I'm talking about. So I uh, don't like seeing him that way. No, he didn't want to be that way. Um, just encourage your prayers for my dad that uh, he could slip away to the presence of Christ. That's what I'm praying for. My brother Todd's with him tonight. Jeff's going to be with him tomorrow. And Melody, we're all, I guess I'm with him Thursday, and Melody's with him Friday. We're all taking turns. Melody was with him on Saturday and Sunday. So we've just been uh, passing the baton among us brothers and sisters. And, um, got a lot of help from good people there at the church and hospice care. So, um, most of the time he's pretty good, but when he's awake, he's not. So just be praying for him, because uh, when he wakes up, he doesn't know where he is. He's just trying to get out of that bed. <laughs> and uh, so really, really appreciate you guys just praying that uh, he, he can just gently pass and not suffer anymore. You start to see him suffering like that. <clears throat> so your prayers and your love and your care are greatly appreciated. Um, thanks to everybody who sent cards and emails and stuff. The past few weeks, there's been a lot to him. Um, I tell you to send more, but he, he wouldn't be able to understand. We still read the cards he gets, but I don't think he, maybe he hears, we'll see. <laughs> we'll get to that in my life. Until uh, <laughs> then, we don't know. Uh, just prayers for Dan would be great. Any other prayer requests anybody have? <clears throat> I was excited. I don't know what happened here Sunday. We had the best attendance on Sunday we had since COVID. Uh, my brother Jeff's church did too. They were up 250 people uh, in attendance. So uh, they had a lot of people coming back. So I think people are crawling out from under the rocks and coming out. And uh, it's really good to see people worshiping. And it's good to see all of you here tonight. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood that gives us confidence, that we can approach your throne uh, with confidence, not because of our righteousness, but because of you and what Jesus did for us on the cross. And I pray, God, that through the power of the blood of Jesus, that you would um, work in our lives and guide us and lead us. I thank you for the study that Dad developed and that we're going through, and I pray that uh, we would benefit from it. Thank you for him, for his life, what he means to me and to so many. Uh, and now at the end of his time, um, as his body is failing, his organs are sh shut down, I just pray now, God, that you would uh, you let him easily slip into your presence and, and not uh, have to bear much more suffering. And I pray you'd be with my brother Todd tonight as he cares for him and give him wisdom to know how to make dad comfortable. And uh, I thank you for um, all the people that love him that are around me. And I pray that you would, you've been glorified in his life, and I pray that you'd be glorified in his death. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last week we finished up online at the temple. If you didn't get to see that, you missed a very interesting study. And I would encourage you to check that out. And it's on the YouTube page. Facebook. Right, for the Christian yeah. Church. Yep. And um, so you can check it out there. Okay, this week, we're getting ready to bump up now that we got, I want to remember these 
symbols because you're going to mesmerize these and have them down and have an outline of the Bible uh, imprinted in your head. So we have the earth, right? And it is in God's hands, there's creation. And then there's a tree that comes out of the earth, and that's got the fruit on it, the good fruit that represents the fall of man. And then there's a rainbow, which represents the flood. It lands on the Tower of Babel, the Zerat, that represents that time period of the dividing of the languages and the nations. And then God calls Abraham, uh, one of the descendants of Shem, and he calls Isaac and Jacob. So that's the time of the patriarch where the God calls Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we have the time of bondage represented by the Egyptian beating the slave. And then we have the Exodus with an exit sign, the giving of the law with the Ten Commandments. And we have the, the shield and the sword, which represent the conquest. And then we have the gavel, which represents the time of the judges. We have the, the crown, which represents the time uh, of the kings with uh, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. And then Solomon built the temple, right? And so we have the time of, of the temple when the temple was built. And then today we talk about the divided kingdom. Now, why do I have a garment <laughs> to represent that? Well... Solomon sinned. Um, turns out, it doesn't matter how smart you are or how wise you are, if you're not righteous. Um, and Solomon, with all his wisdom and all his advantage and all his wealth, did not obey the Lord, and he married all these foreign women. Now, most of these marriages were not about love. They weren't even about sex. They were about... Uh, political alliances. So he married the daughters of all these kings to create a political alliances with all these nations so that they wouldn't go to war. So these queens were more like ambassadors. And as ambassadors, they brought along their religion and their false beliefs. And when he did have children with some of them, the, the descendants of Solomon, of course, were raised by ungodly women. And the Lord said to Solomon, because you've done this and you've not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear it away in the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David, for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. So, I'm not going to take the whole kingdom away from you. Now, that's what he did to Saul. With Saul, they took the whole kingdom away from him. Remember, Saul said, you know, stay with me, Samuel. And Samuel started to walk away, and it ripped Samuel's coat. And Samuel says, just like you ripped my garment, God's going to rip the kingdom away from you. So God has, for whatever reason, <laughs> decided to use this tearing up a coat motif uh, when he talks to kings. So he did that with Saul. He's now doing that with Solomon. And then we're going to see what happens. He, um, he has a son, uh, Solomon has a servant named Jeroboam. The Jeroboam proved to be an effective leader. And Solomon, being wise, recognized Jeroboam's leadership quality and put Jeroboam in charge of a bunch of stuff. One day, Jeroboam is going on his way on a journey, and a prophet, a hydrant, comes up to him, and the hydrant says, takes his coat and rips his coat. Now, I don't know about you, but somebody takes my coat and rips it up, I get frustrated. But he takes his coat, his prophet does, rips it up and says, take ten pieces for yourself, and this is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you ten tribes. So he says, I'm going to give you ten of the tribes of Israel to rule, and, and, I'm, and Solomon and his house are only going to keep Judah and Benjamin. And so, it was a big deal. Now, I don't know whether the word of this got back to Solomon, or I don't know whether he, uh, Jeroboam foolishly told somebody, or whether it was the fact that God came to Solomon and said, hey, I'm going to rip the kingdom away from you. And he, like Saul, sat and wisely looked around and figured out and discerned who it was going to be. Well, it's probably going to be this Jeroboam clown. He's, he's already running half the country, you know. Somehow Solomon figured it out and tried to kill Jeroboam. So now Solomon's trying to murder somebody. And Jeroboam escapes down to Egypt, so Solomon dies. After Solomon dies, Jeroboam comes back. Well, David's son Rehoboam takes the, the kingship. 
And all of the tribes say, hey, we want to have a conference. We want to get together. We want to have a powwow here. We want to talk because we're not happy. And so they come to the king and they all gather together. All the elders of all the tribes come and say, hey, your father was a tyrant. Uh, he overtaxed us. Uh, he quartered soldiers in our house. Uh, he had military troops stationed all around. This sound familiar? This is like this is like the complaints of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he was taking our lands and stuff. But, you know, we don't have any representation. <laughs> they're they're basically upset because Solomon has become a total tyrant. Solomon wasn't supposed to have a standing army, but he did. He wasn't supposed to collect horses and chariots, but he did. He wasn't supposed to marry foreign women, but he did. Uh, he was supposed to drive out the Amorites, the Jebusites, the, you know, all the ites, the mosquito bites, all of them. He was supposed to drive them all out, and instead of driving them out, you know what he did? He left them there so he could tax them. He's like, hey, why would I, why would I drive these people out? Like God said, why just leave them there and make them servants and tax them? And so because of that, the idolatry of those people stuck around and affected the Israelites. And so he did all kinds of things he wasn't supposed to do as king. And the people knew it, and they were upset, and they were sick of it. And so they said, hey, Rehoboam, this is your chance to be a different kind of king. We, we, uh, we want a different kind of kingdom. This, this stinks. And Rehoboam gets together, and he ignores all of his father's advisors who would have told him to say lower taxes, you know, be less of a tyrant. But instead, he listens to all the young ones. Now, they just came out of Jerusalem University, and they had all these crazy ideas they got from their liberal professors about how things are going to be better, and how they could uh, use government to fix all the problems. But what we needed to do was raise taxes. So he said to the people, we're going to raise taxes. In fact, you think my father, his thigh was big, stomping on you? Well, my pinky will be bigger than his thigh. In other words, I'm going to raise taxes, I'm going to work you harder, I'm going to take more of you service, I'm going to take more of your land, I'm taking more of your stuff. I am here to make your life even worse. And so, but boom, but boom, you got a civil war. And along comes Jeroboam, going around and said, the prophet said, I'm supposed to be king. And everyone's like, you the man, you, are, you were ruling us before with Solomon, you were a good leader, we're following Jeroboam. And so, most of Israel follows Jeroboam, and they leave, and they divide the kingdom, just as the prophets had declared were happening. And so because of the sin of Solomon, and the sin of Rehoboam, who was like Solomon, and the Bible says he was not like David, he did not follow God with all of his heart, but because Rehoboam was like his father Solomon, God took the kingdom away from him. And the only reason he didn't take it all he would have taken it all, but he promised David that one of his descendants would stay on the throne. And he had to keep the messianic line that the Messiah had to come from David. He had to keep that alive. The only reason that David's line didn't end was because of that promise God. If, if it hadn't been for that, Solomon would have. That would have been it. Because God doesn't allow tyrants to prosper. You can't rebel against God and, and prosper. It doesn't work. It, 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 it's never worked. You go, history is riddled with the ruins of empires that refuse to follow God. Name me one that turned away from God and from righteousness that lasted. It doesn't. They don't exist. No such thing. And a country will not long prosper that turns its heart from God. So the kingdom was divided. And uh, take ten uh, pieces for yourself, he said. So you're gonna, Jeroboam's going to get the kingdom. Now, uh, Jeroboam was dumber than dumb. Because God comes to him and says to Jeroboam, I'm going to make the same offer to you I made to David. Oh, really? What's that? If you'll honor me, you'll follow me, you'll serve me, I'll make you an everlasting lion. Now, how is God going to do that? How is God going to make Jeroboam an everlasting lion? And have David be an everlasting lion? 
I don't know. God can work with this kind of thing, though. Who knows? Who knows how a descendant of Jeroboam and David would have been on the throne, but God could have somehow worked that out. But that's what he offers Jeroboam. Jeroboam doesn't take him up on it. He says, you follow me, you, you, you treat me, I'll, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll do you what I did to Saul. And Jeroboam sat and he saw every year at Passover, people were going to Jerusalem where Rehoboam was still king. And they're going down and celebrating Passover. And then they're going there for Pentecost. And then some of them went down for the Feast of uh, Trumpets. And some of them went down there for the Day of Atonement. They kept going back to Jerusalem because that's the only place you were allowed to worship is where the priests were at the temple. And he thought, you know, people that worship together get together. And this country is going to be reunified under David's descendants. Who am I? I'm not the famous David. And my sons won't keep the kingdom if my, these people keep going and worship them. Now, that's not, what, that's not true. That's the opposite of what God promised him. God promised him that if he'd be faithful and follow him, that he'd establish his house. But Jeroboam, he wouldn't. So you know what that clown did? He set up two different golden calves in the northern ten tribes, one in each section, one on one side of the Jordan, one on the other side of the Jordan, and said, here's your God, come offer your sacrifices here. We don't offer sacrifices in Jerusalem. We offer sacrifices here. And he got the people of Israel to worship God, but not God's way. Worshiping the golden calf. And it led them all into idolatry. And so God curses them. He said, none of your descendants are going to prosper. You're not going to have anybody that gets on the throne. None of your family, if they're in the country, uh, the birds will eat them. If they die in the city, the dogs will eat them. And that, that came to pass. What happened to uh, Ahab, king, his, his, and his wife Jezebel? What ate their blood? Dogs. That came to pass. And the curse that the prophet put on him gave all his descendants. Uh, they were either eaten by birds or by dogs. <laughs> and the line doesn't last. And it's not very long until the Assyrians come and wipe them out. There never was a good king of the ten northern men. Not one. Not one descendant of Jeroboam was good. They were all bad. We read about Ahab. He was bad. We read about Jezebel. She was bad. All their children, all the way up to them, bad, 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 bad. It wasn't one good king. Now, there's some good kings and bad kings of Judah. But there's nothing but bad news from the line of Jeroboam. And because he just wouldn't trust God. You know, there's a lot of people that they could have been blessed like David. They could have been a part of God's plan. God would have worked them in and made what they're about eternal. But they were afraid of losing everything. So they compromised themselves. A lot of people don't obey God. A lot of preachers don't obey God because, well, well I'll lose. I'll lose my ministry if I, if I take a stand. Or I'll lose, I'll lose this if I. And they're people pleasers. Instead of God, and they're trying to build their own kingdom. But Jesus said, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. David submitted himself, repented, trusted in God, and was forgiven. And so his kingdom is forever. But this guy wouldn't repent. This guy wouldn't follow God. And so his kingdom came to a most abrupt and terrible end. And what the Assyrians did to the Israelites is despicable. It's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and because he thought the Ninevites might repent. Jonah didn't want to not go to Nineveh because he was afraid they wouldn't listen to him. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because he's afraid they would listen to him. 
He says, if I go warn them and they repent, God will forgive them. And I don't want him to forgive them. I want him to die. Because Jonah hated the Assyrians, whose capital was Nineveh. What, what, how would you feel if China, say, was able to attack the United States and defeat us militarily, killed most people, uh, knocked down the uh, Statue of Liberty, flattened Washington, D.C., took thousands of Americans and put uh, a ring in their nose and then put pierced their tailbone and put a, a metal ring in their tailbone and then chained them from nose to tail and made them march hundreds of miles like that, buck naked into captivity. And anybody who died or couldn't keep up or fell in the way, they just murdered. Who took the leaders and anybody who had opposed them in the military and stretched them out and nailed them to the ground and then skinned them alive. The Bible doesn't tell me that. The Assyrians tell me that. Then they carved pictures and paintings of it that we can see to this day. What they did to the Israelites and the other nations around them was horrible. The, the people of Nineveh were wicked, just cruel, cruel people. And what was done to the northern tribes was horrible. What was left of them, by the way, in the land, there weren't many left, but the ones who did survive intermarried with the Gentile people and continued to worship in those mountains. And in the New Testament, what are they known as? Samaritans. Who were the Samaritans? They were former descendants of people who were Israel who uh, intermarried with those people. And so the, the very few that survived became answers. And then what was the problem with Samaritans? Where would they not go worship? In Jerusalem. They thought you'd worship on a mountain there, right? Remember, that's what the woman at the well asked him, who was the Samaritan. Where did they get that idea that you worship in a mountain up there and not down in Jerusalem? Jeroboam! In the time of Jesus, 800 years later, you still got the same religious argument going on because of Jeroboam and his wickedness. And so that's who the Samaritans are in the Bible. And uh, so Jesus loves and saves them. So they first they preach to Jerusalem, Judea, then where? Samaria, the half Jews, and then the utmost parts of the earth. And so the people of Samaria, the great Philip goes up there, there's a huge revival, and a whole bunch of people get baptized in Samaria. Um, many people became Christians um, because uh, of the preaching of Philip. And so this, that's where the Samaritans come from, is from those people. Now, down south, in the divided kingdom. So from then on in the Bible, when it refers to Israel, after, in 1 Kings, 2 Kings Chronicles, after the division of Jeroboam and Rehoboam's kingdoms, Rehoboam being the son of David, Jeroboam being the servant of Solomon who became king. After that division, from then on, the northern tribes are referred to in the Bible as Israel, and the southern, Benjamin and Judah, are referred to as Judah, the kingdom of Judah. So that's why when we get to the New Testament, where Jerusalem is and the surrounding areas and that stuff, that area is called, not Israel, but they're called Judea, and they're not referred to as Israelites anymore, they're referred to as Jews. Get it? Now do you understand? Because now they're, they're part of it. Now you say, well, Kendall, how did we have representatives of all 12 tribes in Judea? Well, the Bible tells us that, and we'll get there in a minute, that one of the kings starts serving God and repenting and finding success. A whole bunch of the people up in Israel, they don't like what Ahab's doing, they don't like what Jezebel's doing, they don't like the paganism and the idolatry going on, so they're all like, you know, this place is going to be cursed, God's going to punish us. Let's go down there where they're still worshiping God, where the king is still following God. So they all left. And so a multitude of people leave the ten tribes, even though that's where they're from, and they go down and live in Judea. And their survivors go into captivity to Babylon, and then the Babylonians take them, the Medo Persians take them up from Babylon, and then they spread them all over the world. And then during the time of Cyrus, some of them were able to come back and repopulate Judea. And that's how you got people from all the tribes 
by the time of Jesus is because some of them fled in Israel before the Assyrians came and destroyed it and lived in the safety of Judea where they were still following God at that time. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's give an overview and then we're going to go through these kings, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Here we go. So, Rehoboam is first. I know this is probably tiny. You can't see it. You have to pronounce it. Um, you have Rehoboam, had, and then he has a son, uh, Abijah, is not good. Uh, King Asa, yeah, good and bad. And then Jehoshaphat, woohoo, revival. Turns back to God. Then Jehoshaphat goes bad. Then Jer uh, Jehoram, uh, Ahaziah, um, Athaliah, bad, bad, bad. Bad dudes. We'll go through them individually in a minute. Then Joash comes along, and he's good. He, and there's another revival. Then Amaziah, Uzziah, and Jotham, they were okay. And then Ahaz, really bad. He's the one who, remember we talked about last week, the temple? He took the, came in and built a new altar that wasn't even the right altar, and then took the uh, labor and put it off in the gravel on the side, totally got rid of the labor, because he didn't think it was cool or something. I don't know. Then, after Ahaz is really bad, then he has a son, Hezekiah, who's good. And this is one of the great revivals. And during Hezekiah, they turn back to God. But then after Hezekiah, he, he makes a mistake in who he marries. And then he has Manasseh and Ammon. And they're bad, real bad. Manasseh was, uh, but, but by the way, Manasseh at the end, though, even though he's really bad, he repents. And then they have Josiah. And Josiah turns to God, and there's another revival. But then Josiah goes bad. So you've got bad ones that at the very end turn good, and you've got good ones at the very end turn bad. Every which way you can imagine happens with these kings. You've got people who are bad and turn good, and they turn bad. You've got some that are good, and uh, go bad, and then turn good. You've got some that stay good, and you've got some that stay bad. You, you have them they're all over everywhere. And what it shows is... Um, the lesson I draw from the kings is people can change. If you're good, you can go bad. If you're bad, you can go good. If you can go good, then go bad. And then you'll go good again. Or vice versa. Every which way you get mad is in there. Okay? The whole idea of election and all that, well, that just goes right out the window with this. Because people have this funny little thing called free will. And then after Josiah, well, that's it. That's the last of it. And Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, which we'll talk about him, and then really bad Jehoiakim, he's the one who gets cursed. And then Zedekiah, who's his uncle. And he, he's told, none of your descendants will ever sit on the throne again. You think, oh no, well, his uncle gets put on the throne. And then his, you think, oh, well, Zedekiah will be the one through who it comes. Uh -uh. Zedekiah gets his eyes poked out right after all his sons are murdered in front of him. So that line is, this guy's line's cursed. And you're like, where is it? How is the Messiah going to come? And what we're going to see through all the kings of Judah, and through the, what we're going to study just, in just here in a second, is this. The devil knows the Messiah is going to come through David. That was prophesied. It was known. And, and David's going to have this everlasting throne until the no one else is going to do us until the time comes when he to him that belongs comes. And so the devil does not want that to happen. So what does the devil do? We're putting, remember, we're using the analogy of a chessboard. What's the devil's move on the chessboard? To send all of his effort to try to destroy the house of God. And so what we see chronicled for us in first and second Kings, first and second chronicles. What we see in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, what we see in the prophets, what we see in the history of Israel, all the way until when Jesus comes, is the devil making a concerted effort to destroy the line of David. And he focuses on the son of David until Isaiah gives a prophecy <laughs> to one of the kings and says, here's a sign for you. Uh, a virgin's going to give birth and, uh, you know, that's going to be the sign. And he's going to, and the devil's like, what? <laughs> a virgin is how the Messiah is going to give birth. That's how the, oh, so then he starts killing the daughters of David. <clears throat> the female descendants. Tries to get all of the women descendants of David killed. 
at the very end with Jeremiah. So it's a crazy, crazy history. All right, let's try to go through it. Rainbow and Jeroboam. I'll bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I'll cut off from Jeroboam every male in Israel. Bond and free. I'll take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as one takes away refuse until it's gone. God was getting a little graphic in his language here. He's basically saying, I'm going to haul you off like a dirty forest, John. The dogs will eat what belongs to Jeroboam and die in the city. And the birds of the earth will eat whoever dies in the field. The Lord spoke. <laughs> when God says, I've spoken, that means there's no change in it. It's like, you know, I, I need to pick that up with my kids. <coughs> I need to do that with Matt. I need to do that with Caleb. Do the dishes. But I've, I have spoken. <laughs> try that. <sighs> First Kings 15.3. Um, then his son, uh, Abijah, walked in the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, in the heart of David, his father. So, these two kings, Rehoboam and then his son, uh, Abijah, they, they were both bad, they, they, both, they both did evil, Jeroboam was bad, he did evil, so there was this time here, the end of Solomon's reign, and then his son, and then his grandson, and then in the north of Jeroboam, because Jeroboam outlived Rehoboam and Rehoboam's son. So Jeroboam had a long rule where Rehoboam and, and uh, Abijam did not have a long rule. Um, they were just, it was just a time of, of bad news. And the people of Israel also perhaps were under bad leadership. Well then Abijah, uh, Satan tried to cause a civil war with King Abijah and Jeroboam. But Judah won. And Judah should not have won. Because Judah was not nearly as big. It was one tribe against, you know, ten other. You know, it's, it was not a fair fight. Um, that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 13. But they won. And then, after this, it's, it, um, Zerah, the Ethiopian, came against Judah. And God delivered. King Asa's prayer is wonderful. It's in 2 Chronicles 14, 11 through 12. Asa cried out to the Lord's God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, Lord, our God, for we rest on you. And in your name we go against this multitude, O Lord. You are our God. Do not let man try to prevail against you. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. So the Ethiopians come up. They, this is one of those periods of time, you know, where Egypt would rise and lower its influence. This is one of those times when Egypt was not the influence, actually the kingdom south of Egypt, the Ethiopian kingdom, had become stronger in Egypt. They conquered Egypt, and now they're coming up here, and they're trying to conquer Israel. And so they come against Judah, little old Judah, and by this time, uh, Asa is king, and so God is with Asa. And Asa, he turns to God. Now, he hadn't gotten rid of the high places, and he hadn't gotten rid of all the, the paganism that was happening that Solomon, he didn't tear down the temples that Solomon had built to these goddesses for his wives. So he wasn't, he, he hadn't, you know, had the courage to completely stand up for, you know, God. But he did trust in God, and, he, and Asa starts turning to God, and God blesses him. And it's at this time, the time of Asa, when things are really bad up in the northern Israel, and they're turning to paganism fast and hard and furious, the people in the northern tribes weren't allowed to come down and worship in Jerusalem anymore. They had to, they were forced by law, by the government, by Jeroboam's kingdom, to worship there. Well, the, anybody of conscience is going to do what? They're going to leave. And all the people who had a conscience that truly worshiped God, that wanted to worship in Jerusalem, they packed up and they left. There's many times in the Bible where in order to do what God wants, you have to flee where you live. Abraham had to get up and get out of Ur of the Chaldees. Um, they had to move around. They had to, they had to go. And there are times when God's people just had to, uh, they had to move. They had to leave. There are times when Jacob, uh, people tried to fight, pick fights with Jacob and the Canaanites and different people. He does well and they come along and take his well. And so he just moved along a little bit of the other one. And there's just times when God's people had, you know, Lot had to just leave Sodom. And this was a time for those people. They didn't want to leave their homes, their ancestral lands. Their, 
forefathers that lived there since the time of Joshua. They didn't want to leave the family farm, but they had to be true to God more than the family farm. So they had to pick up and leave. They went down to Asa's kingdom. Um, some of the, uh, uh, Israel came to live uh, in Judah. They saw God had blessed Judah for obedience. The king tried to prevent this by war. He had gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers out of them, of Ephraim and Asaph, out of Simeon. They fell, out, um, fell to him out of Israel in abundance, and they saw the Lord his God was with him. See, they, they joined him. They say, God's with this guy. God's with Asa. He's helping Asa. Let's go over there. Um, and then back the queen tried to introduce idolatry and, and was the, the throne. So Asa's mom, she was one of those foreign women, right? Pagan. And she tries to get, she's the queen mother. And so she tries to get everybody. And so he's like, sorry, mom. And he has to, he has to have his own, his own relation, his own mom put down. I mean, can you imagine how hard that would be? But he put God first. Uh, Asa was attacked by uh, Basha, king of Israel. And Asa turned to Syria, then Hadad for help. Now, all along, Asa had been doing good. He'd been doing good. He, he prayed, God, we don't need a whole lot of people to help. You can help us defeat the... And then so God was like, okay. God, this woman, she's trying to start a God here. He got rid of her. He's doing good. He's doing good. And then Israel attacks... And instead of turning to God, he turns to stupid Ben Hadad. Well, God was not pleased. So God said to him, you know, you did wrong, told him you did wrong, and, and put a sickness in his feet. And instead of saying, God, I repent, I'm sorry, heal me of this, he, he again doesn't turn to God. You ever notice how some people don't learn? Some people don't get it. Like God, the, the Lord will send them a little warning or, you know, a little discipline, and instead of repenting, they just get worse. And he didn't pray to God to do it, and so he died. If he had prayed, repented, God had healed his disease. But he wouldn't repent. So he died. And that was the end of Asa. And it's a sad ending. Because he started off so good. And uh, one of the things that Dad talked about when he did this is, Prayer should be our first resort, not our last resort. With the Ethiopians, he had no one to turn to and no help. So he prayed to God, and God helped him. But when he had what he thought was help from Ben-Hadad, he didn't turn to God. He turned to Ben-Hadad. Um, and he talked about how some people, they won't pray about an ailment until they're in the hospital or something. And prayer... Before you go to the doctor, you go to God. And it, this isn't teaching us not to go to the doctor. This is teaching us to go to God first. And prayer is not a last resort. Prayer should be your first resort. For any and every problem, need, or concern in your life, prayer should be your first resort. And then, hey, Dad, uh, you don't need him. <laughs> so then came King Jehoshaphat. back. He walked in the ways of Asa and followed God, but he allowed the high choices. You know, he was a good guy, but he had this live and let live thing, you know, let the pagans be pagan. And he allowed these high places to continue to exist. He also made peace with Ahab, who was one of the descendants of uh, um, Jeroboam, thank you. And that was bad. Why was that bad? Because then he gets drugged into a war and has to fight a war with a dummy. Don't enter into covenants with people who God's about to punish. Okay? You know somebody, he's living a real immoral life, let's say. And he comes to you and says, Hey, I've got this very successful business. Come invest with me in this business. Become my business partner. Don't be stupid. Don't go buddy-buddy with somebody who the Lord is about to bring down. Okay? If God's coming after Sodom and Gomorrah, get out. Don't go in. In fact, when you get out, don't even look back. Don't go making deals 
You know, when the Bible says to um, not be unequally yoked, <clears throat> we always apply that to marriage. And it does mean marriage, but it means more than marriage. Don't be yoked to people who aren't Christians in business. Don't be yoked to them in any way. Because you get, you get tied to uh, somebody who God's bringing down. That's like an anchor. It's like an albatross. Or a, you, know, <laughs> you don't want to be going into partnership with somebody God's about to bring, at, bring down. You think real long and hard before you, who you associate with them. And he, he's like, oh, we'll be good to make peace. I mean, we've been at war since the time of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and we haven't had peace. It'd be smart to make peace. Well, it's good to have peace, but don't go into your covenants that when he gets sucked into a war, you've got to go. And then what else did he do? What other stupid mistake did he make? He made the same dumb mistake as Solomon. He married his son to one of Ahab's daughters. Big mistake. This chick was like, you don't get the daughter of Jezebel to marry. Why would you want your son? To have Jezebel as a mother-in-law. That's like, I don't know. I'm going to marry myself off into the, you know, into a crime center. What do you think? You know, you know, I, maybe if I married my son to the daughter of a mob boss, that'd be a good idea. No! <laughs> Who you, what family you marry your kid into? And the scripture says it, not me. I didn't say it. The scripture says it. As a mother is, so is her daughter. And uh, I've told my son, I said, you want to know what you're married in? In 20 years, go meet her mom. Because <laughs> I don't care how many women say, I'm not going to turn out like my mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, find a, you find a woman who's got a good mom, you know, and make sure her mom's a good kid. Okay? Because beauty is temporary, eating's forever. Okay? <laughs> like if her family's from Kentucky originally, <laughs> that chicken's going to be good. <laughs> he, he made peace with Ahab and married off his daughter. And we're going to see why this was done. We're gonna, I mean, that, that move right there literally came within one person. And within one person of wiping out the entire line of David. That, him doing that, gets his grandsons and great-grandsons all killed except one. Because that chick was bad news. She wasn't just a pagan. She was a murderer. She was evil. Just like Jezebel. I mean, her mom was so wicked, God had her thrown out of the way and eaten by dogs. That should tell you something right there. <laughs> so King Joseph had a good guy with dumb decisions. You can be a good guy and, and follow God yourself, but if you're not wise and who you hang out with, you can curse your children. And cursed they were. Jehoram, Joseph had a son who married Athaliah, that was her name, was made king. She was the daughter of Jezebel. Now, Jeroboam kills all his brothers and princes. And all the enemies of Judah came out against him for punishment. He was smitten and died of disease of the bowels. Who do you think God gave him the idea of killing off all his brothers so that he would be the only one from whom the kingship would come? Hmm. His wife, you know, the same wife where his, her dad was sitting there going, that guy over there's got this vineyard, I really want it, he won't sell it to me. She's like, don't worry, honey, I'll take care of it. She goes and kills the guy. And then he gets the vineyard. That's what Jezebel did. Like, Jezebel's option for anything was to kill him. Right? I mean, remember Elijah? She went around and killed all the prophets and and Elijah had to go up, and she had these 120 prophets of Baal that had gone around and killed everybody, and he challenges them to a competition. That's all this time period. So, uh, the promise of David had been the male descendant of David's royal blood would sit on the throne of David until the Messiah came. 
By killing all his brothers and sons, the promise fell upon Jerem and his sons. Yet all of Jerem's sons were killed by the incoming Arabians, sons of Ishmael, except Haziah. So, he kills off anybody else who the king church could come, and only leaves his sons. But then God strikes him with the disease of owls, and the Arabians go, hey, they're weak, the king's dead, let's attack. And they attack, and they kill all the, his sons, except one who escapes, and he becomes king. And so, the life of Isaiah uh, hung the promise. And then he goes to war, and he ends up dead. Look, he allied Judah with his brother-in-law, Jerome of Israel. So he's still alive with Israel to fight the enemies of Israel. Meanwhile, King Jerome of Israel was overthrown by Jehu at God's command to execute right on Ahab and Jezebel. The sons of Isaiah brothers were present at the slaughter, by Jehu were all slain. Thus the princes of Judah could not be the ones to carry on the Messianic lineage. And the house of Isaiah had no power left to hold the kingdom. And even Isaiah was slain. Now the only ones left are the sons of Isaiah. You see how the devil just keeps attacking and attacking and getting wicked people to come off? I mean, anybody who was related to the king or, or in line to be king or anybody... The devil was working to get them killed. And if he couldn't kill them because they were righteous, he would drag, he would tempt them to sin, drag them to sin, marry them off to some sleazy girl. Well, what's this? Uh, now he's dead, and one of his sons has to become king, and they're all too young. So what's this Queen Athaliah? The grandma, okay? So she was his his mother-in-law, or his mom, excuse me, his mom. And Isaiah's mom. And he, he dies, so his mom becomes queen mother. Athaliah declares herself queen. She took the reins of government. She planned the slaying of all her grandchildren. Scripture states that of her that she thought she killed all the royal seed from the house of Judah. These are the very ones through whom the Messiah would come. However, Jehoshaphat, the king's sister, and, and what a hero she was to keep the line of David going, had hidden one boy named Josiah in the temple. Because where's the one place that Athaliah wasn't going to go? The temple of the Lord. For only men were allowed. Now the king could have walked in there, but the queen came. And so, in the men only club, she hides the little boy from the queen. And there he's hidden for years. And the, the priest risks his own life in the life of his son to save this boy and to save his life. Um, that's why he served the throne for six years until uh, Jehoiada, the priest, anointed Joash as king. So he waits till the boy's old. I mean, he's just young. He waits six years. And once the boy's old enough, I think he's like eight or something. He takes him out, puts him on a donkey, puts him on a woo, and he anoints him. Here's the king of Israel. And everyone's excited. Wait, what? One of David's sons still lives? Woo! And everybody's celebrating. Now, she was illegitimate, took power by deception, was not the rightful heir to the throne, had killed those who were rightful heirs to the throne, but what does she say? When they come, when, when the kids crown, she starts going, treason, treason, treason. You know, often the people yelling treason are actually the ones committed. And actually the rightful person who should be in power is not the one committing the treason. It's the person yelling it. And so she realizes Everyone's happy with this. She starts to take off back for Israel where she was born, and they killed her on the way. And as a descendant of uh, Jerome, uh, I'm sure the birds ate her. So Jehoash becomes king with this priest, this good priest who had raised him for six years and made him king, risked his own life to make him king, and he becomes king, and he is a good king. Well, Jehoiada lived, he reigned, it was very prosperous, but after the death of Jehoiada, Joash fell into the hands of bad advisors, who, at whose suggestion 
He revived the worship of Baal and Asherah, which is who his grandma, who tried to kill him, had worshipped. I mean, this is the biggest case of Stockholm Syndrome I've ever seen. Why is he going and worshiping Baal and the gods of this wicked grandmother and ignoring what he was taught by Jehoiada who had saved his life? When he rebuked for this by Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, Joash caused him to be stoned to death in the very court of the Lord's house. And that's what Jesus refers to in Matthew 22, uh, 35. He talks about the wicked people who participated in the killing of the prophets. And he talks about the killing of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, who was killed between the altar and the temple. The priest's son. So the son of the guy who saved his life, he has a murder. Talk about a good king going back. You ever know somebody like that? They were pretty good, followed God, as long as their parent was there, or that person was there. But then maybe that preacher dies, or the person who converted, or their parent, or whoever that person was the influence in their life, they disappear, and so does their faith. And all of a sudden, they go wild. <clears throat> Have you ever known kids who are good kids, they graduate from high school and God all at the same time? They go off to college, and was this even the same person? Who are you? Have you ever known somebody who would be like, I can't believe they're, I thought they followed God. But their faith was based on another person in their life. There's some people, and the only reason they're doing what's right is because there's this person in their life, not because God is in their life. Make sure when you're trying to raise your kids to follow God that you lead them to Him. And they're not obeying for you, but they're obeying for Him. The key is not to build such a great relationship with your children while they're with you. The, the key is to build a relationship of them with God. And that's what Jehoash didn't have. So that very year, because he did this, King Hazel, king of Syria, came up against Jerusalem and carried off a vast booty in the prize of his departure. Jehoash had scarcely escaped this danger. He fell into another fatal one. Two of his servants conspired together and slew him in his bed in the fortress of Nero. So first God comes and takes all his money, and then God has him put down. Because he sinned. He was a good king. Gone bad. And good people can go bad. Bad people can go good. Then came Amaziah. He killed the men, killed his father. Not the good. Fought a war against Edom, which God gave victory. And then brought the gods of Edom back and sent them up to Jerusalem. What? So, hello. Hello, big Amaziah. Hello. What do you think? What are you thinking? Your dad has success. God blesses him. But then he sets up the gods of the woman who tried to kill him, so he punishes him. So he dies. You punish the guys who killed him. And then you trust in God. You go fight against Edom. God gives you victory over Edom. And then you set up the gods of Edom in Jerusalem. What do these people think? So he fought the northern tribes of Israel, was defeated, and eventually he was assassinated like his father. And so, he, he sets up these false gods. God removes him. Then came Uzziah. He reigned 52 years, served God, and was influenced by the prophets. Thus, Judah was prosperous and successful. So Uzziah starts serving back to God. However, he became prideful. Mm, 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 mm. He was a good king, followed God, did pretty good, even got rid of some of the business. But then he started thinking he was all that. Have you ever seen that? Somebody's like, well, mine compared to these guys, I am oh, I, I am close to God. Well, God had commanded that only who could go into the temple. I mean, the, the, the holy place. The priests. And only who could burn the incense before the Lord. The priests. Only who could offer sacrifice. The priests. And he became prideful and presumptuous. And he wanted to go in. After God blessed him, well, I want to go worship God. I can offer the sacrifice. Who, by the way, priests, I want to offer it. The priests are like, no, no, stop. And, and the priests go up, and the priest is trying to stop him from offering incense. And the king is going to whack him, and God strikes the king's hand, and it turns white with leprosy. He's like, 
And he's going to go, he flees to his palace and is never seen again. And his son rules the kingdom while he slowly dies of leprosy. Because he tried to strike the Lord's priest in the temple and offer incense. So Uzziah comes to a sad end. After him came King Jotham. Jotham did not remove idolatry completely, and his sons became wicked. And then came Ahaz. Ahaz walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his sons pass through the fire. What's that mean? He offered his children as sacrifices to more baby children. I'm telling you, society, when it's really bad, is ripe for destruction. When God's going to do something, is when you start killing the babies. When babies start dying, God's going to step in. He'll let that go on for a few years. He'll let that go on to try to get people to repent. And he'll, he'll send a salvo. First, he'll have a military war. He'll send some disease, some sort of plague or something. Pandemic. And when people don't listen, and they won't listen, and they won't listen, he'll bring them back. Period. In a sentence. Naming a time when it didn't happen. What happened to, what happened to Egypt when they killed babies? What happened to the Canaanites when they killed babies? What happened to the Assyrians when they killed babies? What happened to the Babylonians when they killed babies? What happened to the Israelites when they killed babies? What happened to Judea when they killed babies? Same thing. God is going to bring you down. He passes his kids through the fire according to the abominations of the nations who the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed them for incense on high places, on hills, and under every green tree. He was just heavily involved in paganism. Ahab was. was a bad guy. Goes up to Israel and Samaria and sees their tent altar. And, well, their altar is cooler than ours. It makes a new altar, removes the, um, the labor from the temple, just changes all the, all the rules of, of the temple, messing with God's divine plan. Remember what Moses said, follow the pattern, get it on the mountain. He wouldn't follow the pattern. He changed things. And God deals with it, removes it. Causes a lot of heartache and trouble. In the days of Hezekiah, he comes to become king. The people of Israel had gotten so bad under Ahaz. You remember that brazen serpent that Moses had made in the desert, in the wilderness? That you look on it and were healed of the snake bites? They started worshiping like it was a god. They were worshiping the serpent that God saved them. Well, God got rid of Ahaz and put it in Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, no more of this. He destroys it. Victory number one for Hezekiah. He brought a great revival. He put away idolatry. He cleansed the temple. Remember how his dad messed the temple all up? He put the labor back. He put the right altar back. He cleansed the temple. He coated it with blood. He re it had been, it had been uh, made unclean. And, and violated with paganism, and he re sanctified and serves a Passover. They hadn't been celebrating Passover anymore. And he celebrates Passover, and he reads about Passover, finds out about Passover, and says, God, we, we need to celebrate this. And the Bible says it was one of the greatest Passovers that ever happened. And this guy had this great, great thing. Well, then the ten northern tribes of Israel were defeated during his time by the Assyrians. And they're taken into captivity. Remember I talked about what Nineveh and the Assyrians did? That's at this time. So we're coming up on the time of Jonah. And God's punishment uh, for their idolatry. Assyria also attempted to take Judah, but the angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 enemy soldiers. <laughs> okay. This is one of the most amazing stories of the Bible. Because um, the king of Assyria, uh, he came and basically surrounded Jerusalem with this huge army and said, surrender. And Hezekiah sends out and says, if you can have all my gold and all my silver, take whatever you want, we'll, we'll pay you whatever trip you want, we, we're, we're your servants. And he says, okay, but you've got to send me all your sons and wives. He's trying to humiliate him, provoke him into war. He wanted it. And what else would the king have wanted all of his wives and sons? Because the devil wanted to destroy 
they have to live. And this guy says, that I can't do. He says, well, then I'm going to have killed every other. Don't think your God's going to save you. Did any of the gods of all these other countries I cut? Did the gods of Israel stop us? Did any of these other gods save him? Gods can't save you from me. There's no stop me. And he, he comes up and he says all this to the king, not through personal notes or letters or emissaries. He has his servants come up and say it in Hebrew before the wall so all the Israelites could hear it. So the Israelites would all be scared inside of Jerusalem. All the Judeans inside of Jerusalem would be scared. And they said, speak. We can speak Assyrian. Speak in Assyrian. They're like, no. These people deserve to hear. They're the ones going to be in siege warfare. They're going to be eating their own manure. And threatens and, and writes this letter and gives it to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is like, takes it into the temple, gives it to the priest, takes it and lays it before the Lord and says, God, what will you do? You're doing something about this. And God says, okay, I will. And the angel of death went out. The avenging angel. You know the one that killed all the firstborn of Egypt? The angel goes out, wipes out 185,000 soldiers in the middle of the night. They, the ones that survived, woke up and we're out of here. And he split. He took off. Left. And Judah survived because of Hezekiah put it in God's hand. And uh, by the way, that's why in the Bible, whenever you see angels, people are terrified. Because most of the time when angels show up, it's not good. Okay? When angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah, not good. When angels came to Egypt, not good. When angels came here, not good. Angels, most of the time, are doing one of two things. Sometimes delivering a message, but most often, somebody's going to die. Angels are killers. And uh, they are servants that are sent to protect God's people. And when you're a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit. Hebrews says that angels uh, are there to minister to you. And if you think that there are angels around us, you don't understand what the Bible is teaching. You've seen them, didn't know. Because they come and they appear and they look like humans. And that's why the Bible says entertain strangers, be nice to strangers, because there might be an angel. You never know who you're talking to or who you're helping or what. And angels are very real, very active throughout the Bible, New and Old Testament. So Hezekiah is saying, well, then Hezekiah, he's about to die. God tells him he's going to die, but he doesn't have a son yet. And he's sad. So the Bible says he's upset. He turns his face against the wall and prays. And so the prophet comes and says, okay, I'm going to give you another 15 years. Well, unfortunately, some bad things happen. He has Manasseh, who's going to destroy everything he built. He builds a, um, a, an aqueduct, which you can still go see. Hezekiah's tunnel is still in Jerusalem. You can, it's like a tourist. When I go there, I plan on walking. You can go through it. It's a tunnel built to give water from a well uh, to the city of Jerusalem during siege warfare. You think, well, that seems like a good thing. He, he realized that they could have siege warfare, so he built this tunnel to get water. The problem is it just prolonged the inevitable. <clears throat> it's like a dragging out. Uh, and, and that's going to be bad in the future. But anyway, um, and then he, after God heals him and he has a son, uh, he does something really stupid. The Babylonians come to visit because he would gotten sick and they heard he got well. And uh, he also had this miracle where you know, the son... The shadow going up the steps. And they heard about that. So the, so the Babylonians sent emissaries to find out about this sign that God had done. They wanted to hear about that. They wanted to basically say, hey, congratulations, you are sick and died, and you got your better. You know? So they're just uh, you know, ambassadors doing what ambassadors do. And he welcomes them and hey, guys, check out. Yeah, God's been good to me. Shadow went up the steps. God protected us from the Syrians. God's great. God's good. Um, hey, want to see my path? Look at all the gold and silver I got. Oh, check it out in the temple. Look at all the golden hair. Woo, pretty fancy. And the big dummy shows him all the money he's got. And it was just like putting up a big neon sign saying, attack us for our gold. Attack us. Now, these Babylonians, they went home, and they didn't attack during his lifetime or his son's. 
But they logged it away. The Judea has a bunch of gold left over. A bunch of gold and silver. And so, when a guy named Nebuchadnezzar comes to power, and he defeats the Assyrians, and he defeats the Medes, and he defeats all the people around him, and he's like, well, who should we go, uh, who should we go attack and take their money next? Hey, you know, when we went down to Judea about 50 years ago, there was a lot of gold in the well, Let's go take Judea. And they did. And the eventual fall of Judea is because this dummy took these ambassadors through and showed them all this vast wealth. Um, he also calls the sons, uh, so after him comes Manasseh. So he has the son Manasseh. Well, Manasseh is bad. Manasseh does not fall in the way of Look what he does. He caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of Sun Him. He practiced soothsaying using witchcraft and sorcery. He consulted mediums and spiritualists. A medium is a person who talks to the dead. Um, he did much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He even set a carved image of an idol he had made in the house of God, which God had said to David and Solomon's son, in this house in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. So God sent the Assyrians to capture him, lead him away with hooks. In prison, he repented and cried out to God who delivered him. And he came back and tried to do undo the idolatry, but the people would not stop worshiping at the high place. So here in Manasseh, we have all these good kings going bad. Now we have a bad king going good. Manasseh is the worst of the worst. Murdered his own children, uh, witchcraft, idolatry. He did all these things. Now, Assyria isn't destroyed yet. So God sends Assyria, and this time, Assyria captures Jerusalem, and they, what well, he didn't capture Jerusalem, but they capture him out in battle outside of Jerusalem. They capture him, and they put a hook in his nose. Remember how I talked about they would pierce their nose? And they put a hook in him, and drug him off, and put him in jail. Now that's pretty hopeless. When you're captured by the Assyrians, who are, they're, they're going to skin him alive. They're going to poke his eyes out, skin him alive, pull him apart. The tortures of the Syrians were infamous. He was dead. And there in prison, as a wicked murderer, a killer, idolater, a witch, as bad as you can get people, okay? He, if he did all the, if he worshipped, set up idolatry, I guarantee you there was sexual immorality, homosexuality, bestiality. All those things were involved in the pagan worship he was doing. This guy was a sicko. And even that guy, remember what his dad Hezekiah had told him about God, and he repented, and he turned to God, and he goes back, God bring me back, I don't know how he got out of jail, I don't know how he got back, but he got back, maybe they said, we'll put you back if you'll, if you'll pay us tribute, I don't know, but maybe God changed the heart of the king of Assyria, maybe Maybe he was captive, and that's when Jonah went, and the people repented, and they repented of their evil doings, and they sent him back. But he gets back. When he gets back, he tries to get rid of all the idolatry. But the people, so they won't follow their king. He had set such a bad example, and he had lived so bad that even though he repented, his, his children, their children, People around, they wouldn't listen. Well, then comes King Ammon. Ammon was 22 years old when he began king. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did evil inside of the Lord, as his father Manasseh had done. For Ammon sacrificed all the carved images of his, which his father Manasseh had made. And he served him. He did not humble himself before the Lord as, as Manasseh, father Manasseh had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. Then his servants conspired against him and killed him in his own house. So that's what happened to him. He didn't even last three years. Well, then his son Josiah becomes king. He started removing idols. And he removed, and he was just a young kid. He starts removing idols and pagan places of worship and restoring the temple. You know, all of there were some good kings that followed God, but they wouldn't get rid of all the pagan stuff around. They wouldn't, they wouldn't get rid of the high places. Not Josiah. Josiah got rid of them. He restored the temple. He found a copy of the law. He, did, he never read Exodus, Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers. He never read it. And so he found in the temple this old copy of the priesthood. 
hey, wonder what this scroll is. And reads it to Josiah. When he heard it, he was so he was so convicted, he tore his clothes and repented. And then he sent word, he asked the prophets, he said, hey, what, what do I do? And they said, uh, well, because of the sins of Israel, God's going to destroy this place, he's going to destroy this temple, he's going to destroy this country. But because you tore your clothes in repentance, I won't do it then. I'll do it later. And he made people commit to following the law. He brought a great revival. He restored the temple, the feasts, and the worship. He totally desecrated the places of pagan worship. He went to the temples uh, on the outskirts of Jerusalem that Solomon had built, and he tore them down. He tore those temples down, and then so that the pagans wouldn't worship there, he took the human remains and bones of people and put them, scattered them all over on this hill outside of Jerusalem where these temples were. Because all those dead bones were there, the place was so, uh, in the pagan mind, so, uh, and now it was full of death, and it was unconsecrated that you couldn't do pagan worship there anymore. They couldn't do pagan worship where there was all these bones. And some people think that that's how the area outside of Jerusalem that became known as the place of the skull came to be. And some people think that's where Jesus was crucified. And so, totally desecrated. I mean, this guy went all out. And for a generation, they worshipped God. He made the leaders promise to follow the law. For a generation, they did what's right. Under his good leadership, it was a great revival. Good king, who took him from a very bad place and, and, and he was following after the heart of his father David and after God, unlike any other. But after him, it went to pot fast. Jeremiah 22 says, This is the Lord, write this man down, childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David, and ruling any more in Judea. Now, after, after Josiah came, Jehoaz. He lasted two years, and he was dead. Jehoiakim, he lasted for, I don't know, like 11 years or something. And then he was dead. He was bad. They're all bad. They're getting worse and worse. And then came Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim is the one who is the first uh, Babylonian invasion. Because he was so wicked. He was so bad. Like Ahab bad. Original Manasseh bad. He was so bad that God says... None of your descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David. They didn't say they wouldn't prosper. He just said they would not prosper sitting on the throne of David. You're, um, when it says, write this man's child, it doesn't mean he wouldn't have kids. He already had kids. It didn't mean he wouldn't have ancestors. He already had ancestors. He's saying that none of them are going to be king. And none of them ever were. And his descendants get hauled off into captivity. They were the princes. All the sons of David in that first captivity, all the smart ones, all the princes, they get taken off. That's who Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, that's who they were. And most of them were castrated. Now they can't have sons. Now, see how the devil ended the, lo ended the line, all these lines of David? He was constantly, if he couldn't kill him, he captured him. And now some of his descendants survived and one of his descendants is somebody you know from the Bible. The husband of Mary, named Joseph. Joseph is a descendant of Jehoiakim. Now, Jehoiakim was not the last king. He gets hauled off in captivity, and so the king of Babylon puts his uncle on the throne, a guy named Zedekiah. Zedekiah rebels again 11 years later. King of Babylon comes back, attacks him again takes Jerusalem, and he lines up all Zedekiah's sons in front of him and kills him and then pokes his eyes out. So Zedekiah doesn't have any more children. So Zedekiah's line ends. So how does this work? How's the Messiah going to come and sit on David's throne when the only one to survive were the descendants of Jehoiakim and they're cursed that they can't sit on the throne? 
devil must have been rejoicing. The devil must have been throwing a party. Because he did. He cursed the only ones left and killed all the other descendants of Solomon. You, all the descendants of Solomon were dead or cursed. It seemed like a victory. It seemed like they won. But remember Isaiah's promise. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and call his name Emmanuel, God with us. So this is where we first get the clue that the son of David, the king, the Messiah, will also be the son of God. That he will also be God in the flesh. Now we've got our first messianic prophecy saying he's going to be God in man. And we also have the first prophecies of the virgin birth. Here's the cool thing. And by the way, after that, that's when the devil started attacking the female in the sense of David too. Uh, in this, when Zedekiah gets killed and everybody's called off, some of the female descendants of uh, David are still alive, and um, the devil sends this wicked guy to come and attack and capture and then this, this guy comes along to save the girls and saves them, and then Jeremiah says, no, we've got to stay here or we'll die, and this guy who wouldn't save the girls, he wouldn't listen, he didn't trust in God, and he made him go, he says, we go to Egypt, we'll all die, and Jeremiah and these girls were kidnapped by this guy and taken out of Egypt where they all die. So they were like that. Not that the lion was going to come through them anyway. Had to come through them. But the devil was dead because he didn't know whether they would be one of the virgins that gave birth. <clears throat> he was afraid of a female descendant of David giving birth as a virgin. And so Jehoiakim's descendants are on the left. The devil's going to be like, yeah, yeah, woo -hoo -hoo. <clears throat> Looked like he won. The devil did not pay attention to the fact when God promised David it would be one of his ancestors that sat on the throne. And it said that the kingly line would go through Solomon. But he didn't say that it would be a physical descendant of Solomon who sat on the throne. David had another son. Many of David's sons died, right? Um, Ammon was killed by the brother. Uh, Absalom, and then Absalom was killed, and then Adonijah set himself up again, trying to take the throne before Solomon, and he got killed. And so who's left? Solomon and Nathan, named after the prophet who rebuked him, who was his brother, the other son of Jesse. And Nathan continued to have descendants. And the devil had overlooked him because he was going after the descendants of Solomon. And that's who Mary is. Mary is a descendant of Nathan, not a Jehovah. So the curse was on, jo on Joseph. Joseph, or nor none of his physical descendants could sit on the throne of David. And none of them did. Even when um, uh, Zerubbabel, who was one of Jehovah's descendants, governs Israel, sit back by Cyrus to govern, he's just a governor. He's not king. No, none, of, none of his ancestors could be king. So the way God got around the curse is Joseph comes out. And Joseph actually had the right to be king of Israel. King of Judea. Instead, he was by right. But he was cursed. So he couldn't. So he had the right to be king. But none of his physical descendants could be king. He married Mary, who was a descendant from another line of David, a descendant of David, but under a different line. They marry. She has a virgin birth. She has Jesus. He's a physical descendant of David to fulfill that prophecy, but he's not a descendant of this uh, bad king, Jehoiakim, who was cursed. And yet, he still has the right to be king from Joseph, because Joseph adopts him as his son. And so he gets the right to be king, and he's a descendant of David, and he's virgin born, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And that's why the virgin birth is essential to our salvation. That's why it's a core doctrine. Why the woman's words are so important? Because we had to get around the curse, Jehovah. 
And it looked like all was lost. There's no way God can pull it off. The devil had won. You can't beat God in a game of chess. It just can't be done. Because he's so many moves ahead of you. You can't comprehend it. And the devil's sneaky and smart, conniving. But he's just nowhere in God's lead. God had it all planned. The same thing's true in your life. There'll be times when it looks like the devil's won. Let's take a let's take a um, break. I wanted to cover the whole thing. Let's uh, let's start back up at at, uh, at eight o'clock. And our next one is going to be the time of the prophets. Now there's some overlap to all of these, of course. Um, because really the time of the prophets really started with Samuel about the time the kings started. There was good prophets all along. But this time is often referred to as the time of the prophets because uh, there's nothing else going for, they're the only ones talking for God. So the, time, the prophets, um, in your Bible, they're in a, a funny order. So in your Old Testament, here's how it's ordered. First, there's what's called the Book of the Law, okay? The Pentateuch, you know, the five books of the law, just as Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First thing in your Bible, right? And then comes the books of history. So then the Bible takes the books of history and puts them in chronological order, right? So you've got uh, uh, Judges, Ezra, you know, Nehemiah. We've got those things, and they're they're over a wide span of history, from the time of Joshua all the way up to the captivity, right? You've got all those history books, first and second kings, first and second chronicles. Um, all those things are put in a chronological order by the type of literature. So there's law books written by Moses, first five. Then there's history books, Joshua, Judges, in a root, all those in, in chronological order. Then there's poetry books, and then they're put in chronological order. And by chronological order, I mean the order in which they were written. So they've got the poetry books, you've got your you got your Job and your Psalms and your, uh, and your uh, Proverbs and uh, Song of Solomon. So they're put in order. And then you got your prophets. Well, you think, well, are the prophets in chronological order? Well, yes and no. It divides it up into two kinds of prophets. There's what's called major prophets, and then you got your minor prophets. You say, well, what's the difference between a major prophet and minor prophets? Well, major prophets, big honk and book. Like Isaiah's got 66 big, huge shadows, right? So Isaiah is a main prophet. Then you got your smaller prophets. And so those, those are how to divide up. But those are put in major prophets in chronological order, and then the minor prophets in chronological order. And so by the time you're done, if you read through the Old Testament, you're jumping all over everywhere. And so, well, Kendall, okay, well, how do I keep it all straight in my head? You know, one of the greatest things I ever did that really helped me is I got one of these chronological Bibles that you read through in a year. And it gave you so much to read a day. And after 365 days, you've read through the entire Bible in chronological order. And it takes the different chapters and portions and stuff and puts them together. So that you go, oh, that prophet lived with that king, lived with at that. Oh, those two kings were together. Okay. And so it helps you keep straight and get a more accurate understanding in your mind how things go. So if you ever want to read through the Bible in a year, you can do it where you just read through the Bible. You know, it gives you so much to read a day and we do it. But my suggestion is if you do the read through the Bible in a year program, then you get one of these chronological jobs. Or you don't even have to buy a Bible. Uh, you can get, just find on the internet, they'll have a list of what to read. They'll give you what to read each day. And you read it right out of your Bible. Just move around in the Bible. And then you'll have an idea of who was with who and what was with what. And what prophet lived during what king's time and oh, so on and so forth. Mike, Kindle. Oh, am I right now? You don't even have it on your ear. Oh. <laughs> Well, it's on, but I don't have it on the ear. It's probably still working. I took it off. I hope it wasn't on when I went to the restroom. <laughs> uh, okay. I didn't hear it when I was down there. Uh, so the majority of the prophets prophesied before the captivity. Um, and then the chart below uh, helps uh, uh, you read. Okay, so prophets prior to the captivity. That's when the Babylonians come and take Judea. Okay? So... Um, 
Jonah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Joel, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk. Okay? So they are the ones that are pre-captivity. During the captivity, who were the prophets? Daniel, Obadiah, and Ezekiel. Okay, that's during the 70 years where they're in captivity. Then prophets following the captivity, you got Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Okay, so they're going to be around the Nehemiah, uh, Ezra, and after time. Okay? And uh, then, of course, during that time, during the captivity, during Daniel, Obadiah, and Ezekiel, that's when Esther does her thing, who we'll talk about next week. Now, I don't know if I'm going to tie, but we're going to try to burn through the prophets. And um, here's what I want to point out about the prophets. It's the same thing that's true of the entire Bible. Everything points to Jesus. Now, I don't have time to go through all the prophecy of all the prophets. No way we can cover that. And that's not the point of this class. The point of this class is to show how the devil was trying to stop the coming of the Messiah. But what the prophets did is they were pointing and they were getting signs and saying, here's, here's, here's the proof. Here's what the Messiah is going to be. Here's how you know when he is and when he's coming. Here are the things along the way. So the prophets are testifying about what's going to come. So they're all pointing to Jesus and to his coming. So as we read through the prophets, uh, as we go through these here, and we're just going to go through them major and minor, uh, you know, um, the, the reason we're going to do this is because I want you to see how Jesus is at the core of what the prophets were about, no matter what the other circumstances and events of the world were. Okay, so Isaiah. What is, well, Isaiah, I told you, he's a major prophet. Uh, and he, um, he has much to say, and this is just a few things that, that I, have, uh, I have listed here that uh, come from um, Dad's list that he has given. Messiah would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7. That's fulfilled in Luke 1, 34 through 35. So this should be in your notes. Um, I'm not sure what page. Um, you go to find Isaiah. So uh, uh, I copied this stuff out of the notes. Uh, uh, or if it's not in the notes, I apologize. I thought I copied it out of the notes. But anyway, follow me here and you can look at your notes later. Uh, by the way, the notes were for a three-hour class. And this is a two-hour class, so I'm happy to give the summation, okay? If you guys want a copy of this, I can email you or whatever a copy of this. You know, just contact me. If you want a copy of this PowerPoint when I'm done with the class, I'll give it to you for free. You know, uh, you know he bought me Hinkles tonight. But I'm, I'm feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> It doesn't take much. <laughs> uh, Messiah would be Emmanuel. That means God with us. That's Isaiah 7. So stick with me on here rather than looking at the notes because I want you to follow us. Messiah would be God and man, Isaiah 9. So the, the deity of God, Christ, is predicted. Uh, Messiah would have seven called Spirit of God. The Spirit of God would be in him. Uh, uh, he would heal the blind, the lame, and the deaf. Now, did Jesus do that? Did he heal the blind, the lame, and the deaf? Yes, he did. Uh, he would be preceded by a forerunner, Isaiah chapter 40. Did somebody come before Jesus and prepare the way for him? Sure. Yes, he did. John the Baptist. Um, Messiah would be a light to the Gentiles. It, did Jesus bring the knowledge of God to the Gentile world as well? Yeah. yeah. Unlike anything else in history. The, the whole world were polytheists. There, there was the Jews and a few um, of the, the Magi or the Zoroastrians who were monotheists. Only monotheists in the world at the time Jesus was born. And by the time a uh, hundred years has passed, idolatry was collapsing. You go a few hundred years into the future, and idolatry is just gone. It is gone from Europe, it's gone from it's gone from Greece, it's gone from uh, Italy, it's gone from I mean idolatry just falls before Christianity. And now uh, um, polytheism is a very rare thing because of Christianity. Um, he was a light to the Gentiles. Messiah would be despised by the Jewish nation. Did the, did the Jewish nation despise, did the leaders despise? Oh yeah, they crucified him. Uh, I pretty much say that's a definition of despising <laughs> crucified someone. Uh, that he would be whipped and beaten. Did that happen? Yes. And that he would die as a guilt offering for sin. Yeah. I mean, Isaiah 50 to 53 
gives this depiction of the suffering servant that Jesus fulfilled. That's amazing. There you have the crucifixion and the death and the suffering of Jesus Christ. His death and his resurrection all depicted. I call uh, Isaiah chapter 53 the gospel according to Isaiah. Because it has the God comes. He's, uh, I mean, the gospel, that's the gospel, right? That's, he just predicts Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's all he does in the book of Isaiah. And so the gospel is foretold. By Isaiah. I, I myself was in Lexington, Kentucky, went to a traveling museum exhibit, and I saw with my own eyes behind three inch uh, bulletproof glass uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And there it sat in front of me. I couldn't believe it. It was kind of small. On goatskin, written hundreds of years before Jesus was born, preserved for centuries in jars that were airtight sealed by the seeing people to keep them being caught, captured by the Romans. Mm -hmm. And there was the, the prophecy of the Messiah written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And yet he comes and fulfills it. So we know Isaiah was written before Jesus. This whole idea that somebody later adjusted Isaiah to make it look like Jesus, that's totally proven false. The, these prophecies are the great truth. Uh, Peter said, um, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories. When, when we follow Christ. He, he says, I'm an eyewitness. I saw his glory on the holy mountain. Talking about the transfiguration. He's like, you know, I'm a witness of his, of his resurrection. I'm a witness of his life. And we have the word of the prophets made certain. Now we know that the prophets were right. What they said came to pass. We have the word of the prophets made certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a light shining in a dark place. I'll never forget when I was a kid, uh, I don't know, third, fourth grade. And um, we moved back from, well, it would have been, it would have been, uh, actually it would have been fifth grade. It would have been fifth grade. Because we moved back from Missouri, and I was seeing my dad every weekend, and I'd go to church every weekend, and Jan Phillips, his secretary, was my Sunday school teacher. And I remember we were going through Daniel, and we came to the prophecies of Daniel about the, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the gold head and the, bronze and you know all this all those prophecies we'll talk about in a minute and I realized I'm like this isn't just something I'm going to believe because mom and dad say so this this is history this is real this is prophecy and it was a light shining in a dark place it showed me and then as I studied more and more you know, I remember going to Hillsboro Family Camp Operation Evangelize you know and the uh, Watchman Quartet they ran the youth program at Hillsborough Family Camp. And I remember the, the baritone singer. He's this big, tall, heavy set, hair, hairiest guy I've ever seen. I mean, <laughs> uh, he, was, he was like a Sasquatch, you know. He's probably, um, he probably. He gets up and he uh, he goes through and he talks about Isaiah in Psalm 22. And, um, and he starts reading these prophecies. You know, I'm like 11 years old going, it's all predicted. And I was real, and I've never doubted at all since. I mean, I've never thought, well, maybe the Bible isn't true. No, it's, you've got prophecies that were written 400 years before Jesus to 2,500 years before Jesus, and they all come true. We've got the words of the prophets made certain. Jeremiah. Uh, he said that Messiah would be God, Jeremiah 23, 6. Messiah would be righteous branch, Jeremiah 23, 5. Messiah would be our righteousness. So here, here we got the imputed righteousness of the gospel. You know? Um, he, is our, he is our righteousness. Our righteousness wasn't good enough. It's not only that Jesus paid for our sins and got us out of the red and put us to zero. He doesn't just do that. When we become a Christian, he puts on us the righteousness of Christ. All of us who have been baptized into Christ have been clothed. clothed with Christ. And now he's imputed righteousness. That means credited. It's a banking term. He, we were in the red, and he not only paid off our debt, once we, he, he canceled our debt, so we're back to zero. We go zero. And then he credits to our account everything that was in Christ's account. So the perfect righteousness of Jesus he credits to my account. And when God looks at my bank account of sin and righteousness, he doesn't see me in the red anymore. He sees me in perfect Christ. That's it. 
that was predicted. That God, and now, Jeremiah also wrote the book of Lamentations. So, if you're wondering who wrote Lamentations, well, that was Jeremiah. So that was the time preceding the destruction of Jerusalem. He writes Jeremiah, the, the book of Jeremiah, and then after the destruction of Jer Jerusalem, he's sad, and so he starts writing down Lamentations, because they were lamenting. So he starts singing the blues, right? And so he writes down his blues album, uh, Lamentations. And that's what that is all about. So um, then comes Ezekiel. Now, he was during the time of the captivity. Um, and he talks about the Messiah being the Son of Man. Again and again and again, he uses the term for prophet as Son of Man. Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man. Son of Man. You, I, I can't remember how many, I think it's 30 some times in the prophecy he uses that term. Now, what's Jesus constantly referred to himself as in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Son of Man. Son of Man. Well, the Son of Man is, you know, what, what's he doing? What's he claiming? Every time he calls himself Son of Man, what's he claiming? Messiah. He's claiming Messiahship. And all the things that Ezekiel said about the Son of Man, he's claiming. And it says he would be a descendant of David at Ezekiel chapter 34, which we already knew that, but it's honing in on who the Messiah would be. Then we have David. The Messiah would be a Son of Man, given an everlasting kingdom. So, Son of Man is an exclusive Ezekiel. Daniel calls him that too. Son of Man just became a word for a prophet. So anybody who's a prophet they refer to as a Son of Man. So what's that indicating about Jesus? That Jesus would be a prophet. And that he would be human. It's both indicating his, his humanity and his prophet. Now, we know that he's going to be a king. Because it's already prophesied he's going to have this eternal throne. He's going to be a descendant of David. So he's going to be a king. And he's going to be a prophet. And then it's going to prophesy that he's going to also be a priest. So he's going to be prophet priest king. You think, well, a priest has to be the descendant of Levi and, uh, and of Aaron, and a king has to be the descendant of Judah. How are those going to coincide? Well, he's not of the Arianic Levitical priesthood. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews explains it. And that's why he's a priest in heaven. And that's why the says in Hebrews, he can't be a priest on earth. And the reason he can't be a priest on earth is because he's not a Levi. But he can be a priest in heaven after the order of Melchizedek in the heavenly tabernacle, the real one. That's why Jesus is not coming back to earth. And anybody who says Jesus is going to come back and reign on earth for seven years and then there's no payment, and they try to take all these verses from Revelation that are symbolic and make them literal and all this kind of stuff, and they totally uh, have bad hermeneutics when it comes to, to Revelation. But Jesus isn't going to come back. The Bible says that he is our intercessor. And that he intercedes for us, and that he's our high priest forever. How long? After the Lord of It says he can be a priest on earth, but that he can be our priest in heaven. So if he's going to be our priest forever, but he can't do it from earth, where is he never coming again? Earth. That's why when Jesus comes back, where does the Bible say we'll meet him? In the air. On the ground? No, where will we meet him? In the air. In the air, because he's never set foot on this place again. When he, when he took off, that was his life. We're going to go meet him in the air. He's not coming down on the earth. We're going to go meet him. He's not going to rule from Jerusalem. They're not going to restore the tabernacle or the, or the, the temple. They're not going to rebuild the temple. All those things, all those prophecies in Revelation are not literal. Is there going to be a literal dragon with ten heads that comes out of the, the, the Mediterranean and takes its tail and swipes a third of the stars of heaven to the earth? Is that literal? No. Well, why do you think everything else is literal? It's not, those are all symbols. And when it talks about a temple, when it talks about a new Jerusalem, when it talks about all things, that's all symbolic, guys. It's all symbols. And those symbols mean something. If you want to understand where those symbols come from and what they mean, read Ezekiel. Read Daniel. Because that apocalyptic symbolic literature, they wrote it first. And apocalypse, now we think, well, it's apocalyptic because it means end of the world or destruction. Because people, because there are things predicted in Jerusalem people consider apocalyptic. But it was apocalyptic literature, but the original meaning of apocalypse is hidden. It's hidden language. Apocalyptic literature is literature where the meaning is hidden because it's symbolic. So apocalypse doesn't really mean destruction. Apocalypse means hidden. And the Revelation is written in the style of Ezekiel and Daniel. You want to understand Revelation? Go back and read Ezekiel and Daniel, study them, understand them, and then you'll understand Revelation. And the reason people don't understand Revelation is they have to study Daniel and Ezekiel. 
and the other prophets. So Daniel gives, it says that the Messiah would come 483 years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. That's found in Daniel 9, and that came to pass. He predicts down to the year. Now some people say, well, wait a second. First, God gives the order to rebuild the temple, and then, uh, and then man gives the order to rebuild the temple a few years later. Which is it? Which one? Well, if you go from when God does it, it'll take you to Jesus' baptism. If you go from where man does it, it'll take you to the tribe of Lenny. Right to the day. It goes right to the day. It's the week before Passover. It's right when it's supposed to be. The beginning of Passover week. The tribe of Lenny. And so, God, God had it down. They should have known. If they had been doing the math, they would have known the time right. Jesus is even like, he even says to him, you guys look at the clouds, and you can say, oh, look, there's these clouds, and the wind's coming from the north, it's going to rain. You can look at the sky and tell what's going to come. But you're not paying any attention to these prophecies that tell what I'm coming. You ought to know that now's the time of your visitation, but you don't understand it's your time of visitation. They didn't pay attention. I mean, even the Magi paid attention. They saw the star sign, and they came, and they said, hey, where's the Messiah born? And the Jews were like, well, it's supposed to be born in Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem. But they didn't go bother to check it out. They, they should have been looking for him. But they weren't paying attention. Um, and, and I think that's probably going to be the way it is for some other people. They should know, hey, Jesus is about to come back, and they're not even paying attention. That's why, what does Jesus tell us to do? Keep what? Watch. Be ready. Get yourself ready. Because he's going to come unexpectedly. Messiah would be killed, Daniel 9, 26. Um, he would be revealed as a stone in his kingdom smash the other kingdoms. Now that's the one. <laughs> uh, okay, so in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He sees a statue, right? And nobody can interpret the dream. He won't even tell what the dream is. And Daniel gets the dream from God and goes and interprets the and says, there's a head of gold on the statue, and then there's a, uh, a chest of silver, and then there's this bronze uh, part, and then there's legs of iron and clay. And the and iron and clay are crushing everything, but then a rock comes out and crushes the iron and clay, and the statue falls, and this small rock grows into a great big mountain and fills the whole earth. Now that's a pretty wild, I mean, I don't know what he maybe he had some meatballs before dinner or something, but he has a pretty trippy dream there, you know, a little too much coffee late at night. I don't know what Nebuchadnezzar's problem was, but he had a wild dream, he didn't know what it meant. And Daniel interprets it. He says, The four different parts represent four different kingdoms. You are the head of gold. After he's going to come a kingdom not quite as good as your uh, silver. And then he's going to come one of bronze, and then iron mixed with clay. And then he interprets it, what the iron and clay means. It'll be partly strong and partly weak. And just as iron and clay don't mix, it's because this nation is going to be made up of so many different nations that they won't mix, and it'll eventually it'll fall apart. And at the time of that kingdom, a rock's going to come down and smash it, destroy the whole statue, and it's going to fill the whole earth and be an everlasting kingdom. Well, the head of gold, we know what the world empire was at that time. The Babylonians. Who comes after the Babylonians? The Medo-Persians. They're the silver. And then comes the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great, right? And what was that metal? Bronze. And what were their weapons made of then? What do we call that time period? Bronze Age. Bronze Age. <laughs> see, like, history calls it that. And then, after them, what, what, did the, what did the Romans develop that made their weapons more, more powerful? Iron. iron. The use of iron. And they had a, came, and it came and it smashed everything, right? That sounds like the Romans. And they came, they came over the world. But why did the Roman Empire eventually fall? Because it was made up of all these different countries, and it just it was too vast, it couldn't control it all. Eventually it splits from east and west, splits into two kingdoms. They moved the capital of Constantinople, you know, and uh, why did the Constantinople get the worst? No business with the Turks. So they, they, that all split apart, and it fell eventually the Roman Empire collapses. And what really destroys it is Christianity. And when does the Messiah come? Right in the middle of the Pax Romana, the hundred years of Roman peace, right at the height of Roman power, during Augustus Caesar's reign, here he comes. Right when they're at their height, and he smashes, and, he's, and his kingdom's like that rock that grows into a great mountain. 
And one little thing of Christianity grows into this giant thing that fills the whole world. And there has not been a world empire since. Nor will there be. And all these one world government clowns that want to do all that, they're not going to succeed. That's not going to happen. Holy Roman Empire started it. Fail. Um, uh, in France, um, Napoleon tried it. Fail. Hitler, yeah, we're going to take over the world. We're going to have a third Reich. No, you're not. You're not going to fail. We're going to last a thousand years. We're going to last a decade. Nobody, nobody's going to have a world empire. The Soviet Union wanted to do it. What happened to them? China wants to do it. What's going to happen to them? Well, how did we try? It's not going to happen. There's not going to be one world empire. They will. <laughs> that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is the kingdom of God is the only kingdom that will last. It's the only one that will fill the whole earth. It's the only one that's going to survive the return of Jesus Christ. And Daniel predicts all of that. And also, Jesus is typified the fourth man in the fiery furnace. One like the Son of God. And God was with him through the fiery trial. And so we see in the book of Daniel, Jesus, Hosea, typified Hosea's faithfulness to his adulterous wife. Hosea chapter 3. So Hosea has this prophet. He comes, this is before the captivity, and he says, God comes to him and says, Ah, I want you to go marry this prostitute. Now, the Lord's asked me to do some weird stuff before, right? Thankfully, he's never asked me to do that. So he goes and he marries this prostitute, and things are good for a while, but then she turns back to her prostitute's ways, and she runs off with these other guys, starts having children out of wedlock, and so he puts her away and lets her run off with these men. And they, and they live, they live, she lives unfaithfully. And then finally, none of those, all those guys eventually end up rejecting her and dumping her. And she's put up for auction, and he goes and gets her back. And he takes her back. And the children that she had with those other men, he adopts them as his own, renames them, makes them his own. And that is an illustration of what would happen to Israel. Israel, because they were not following God, right? They were, they were, it, unfaithful to God and worshiped false gods. So God sold them into captivity. And the Babylonians had them for a while, and the, the Medo-Persians had them for a while, and the Greeks had them for a while, the Romans had them for a while, but then God took them back. And God not only had brought back Israel, but all the, the illegitimate children. Who were them? Me and you. The Gentiles, the Samaritans, the non-Jews. And so that, the whole book of Hosea, his whole life, was an allegory of God and Israel and us. And so what's it predicting? It's predicting that the Messiah will take back the Jew and the Gentile. And then what do we read? And we read Romans chapter 1. The gospel is the power of God and their salvation. First for the Jew and then for the? Yeah. For uh, his wife's name is Gomer. <laughs> Not a real popular girl's Bible name. Don't know any Gomers. <laughs> Knew a Gomer pile. Um, but, uh, um, go so we're, we're Gomers. Uh, he, he took his back. Um, Messiah will offer salvation to all mankind in Joel. We see it. Now, you start to see how many prophecies are saying light to the Gentiles, salvation for the Gentiles. See how the prophets are starting to prophesy our salvation? And then, Messiah would baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Joel 2, 28, 32. When was that fulfilled? That's fulfilled. That's not happening now. But in Acts chapter 2, it says that that was fulfilled. Peter says, that he quotes that passage, he says, Today is that fulfilled, so it's done. It's not going to happen again. There's not, God's not going to come with a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire aren't going to sit on our head. They're like, we're Pentecostal. We're just like the Jackson. We're Pentecostal. Like, really? Where's the sound and where are the tongues of fire? Let's see them. No, that's fulfilled. That's done. Passage fulfilled. Don't try to apply that to you. That was, that's done. Complete. End of story. Um, so Hosea, but Hosea predicts us. And Amos and Odai, the God would darken the day at noon during Messiah's death. Amos 9, 8 and 9. Uh, the Messiah would come after Edom falls. Judah is restored. It says, this company of Israelite exiles who are in Canaan 
will possess the land as far as Zarephath and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Zarephath will possess the towns of the Negev. The deliverers go up to Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. So when the Babylonians came and took them captive, some of the people that weren't in Jerusalem, they split, and they were trying to get away. So they're fleeing out of the country, okay? They're uh, refugees. And they're leaving, and as they're trying to leave the country to get into Edom, the Edomites sit there and wait and kill them and take their stuff. They're the descendants of Esau. They're their cousins. And they're killing them as they're fleeing. And God says, oh, that's how you treat my people. All right, you're going to be wiped out. And these people who are being taken into captivity that you're despising, I'm going to bring them back. And I'm not just going to bring them back to Judea and let them possess Judea. I'm going to give them your land. And your cities and your mountains, they're going to rule them. Because you did this to them. These people you despise, that you think you're better than them, the ones that you're killing, their children and children's children are going to come back and they're going to possess your land and they'll all be dead. And so now we know from, from uh, uh, Obadiah that Edom won't exist when Messiah comes. And there's a whole bunch of prophecies like that. Tyre is going to fall. Sidon is going to fall. Samaria is going to fall. Nineveh is going to fall. Babylon is going to fall. Um, you know, Persia is going to fall. Um, the Greek Empire is going to fall. And it will be during this fourth kingdom. I mean, it predicts world events. Now, you guys, can you imagine if I said, yeah, someday in the future, uh, Messiah's going to come. And when he comes, Canada and Mexico won't exist. China won't exist. Russia won't exist. And you're like, Kendall, how could it ever be that Canada and Mexico and Russia, and those China don't exist? You wouldn't believe me. It would seem too fantastic. Too impossible. That's what it was like when these prophets were given. Edom? Edom's been around for 2,000 years. What do you mean Edom's not going to? Tyre and Sidon? They're powerful seaports. They won't, no one will ever destroy Tyre and Sidon. How would you get to them? The city's built out on this peninsula. You couldn't even get at it. It's impossible. How would you defeat Tyre and Sidon? The Babylonians, the ones that are conquering us, the massive world empire, the Babylonians are going to fall? Have you seen the wall around Babylon? That place isn't going down. It all seemed impossible. But it all came to pass. See, he again and again prophesies world events that are impossible, unthinkable. But they all go there. Jonah, Micah. So Jonah, remember, he was, how long was he in the valley that way? <laughs> right? <laughs> what, what's that comedian's name? He was always telling people, here's your song. Um, yeah. uh, Jeff Foster. Yeah, he goes like, you might be a redneck if, you know, when you, here's your sign. I was down there in uh, Kentucky uh, two weeks ago preaching, and uh, 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 I, was with, I was with Aaron Davis's family. And I don't know if you've ever met Aaron Davis's parents and brother and sister, but those people, I mean, I like Aaron. He's cool and all. I mean, he's all right. But his <laughs> family, man, I like these. So his dad owns this uh, store that sells fruit from all over everywhere, and a furniture store and all this down there in this, you know, Kentucky. And they live on the second floor. Well, his mother-in-law was living with them, would come over and stuff, and she couldn't get up the stairs to get up to their place. So he built this elevator thing next to this like, a little shaft thing. But he, elevators are expensive, and he had to get stuff. And so he would use his forklift that he used to move his fruit stuff around, and he'd put her in this, you know, and then he'd take his forklift and lift it up <laughs> and get her up to the second floor of their apartment, and she could go in. Stuff. And so I told him, I said, this reminds me of Jeff, Jeff Fox was here. If you ever made an elevator for your mother-in-law out of a forklift, <laughs> you might be a redneck. <laughs> and uh, they thought that was hysterical. I, mean, I really like, his parents are just, and man, his mom, see what I'm talking about though? Kentucky yeah. woman that can cook. I'm telling you, that food was good. <laughs> um, so here, the Messiah says, you know, uh, here's your sign. Jesus said, they're like, come, show us a sign, show us a sign. He just fed 5,000 people yeah. with a few loaves and fish. He just fed five, and they only counted them in. So really, 10,000 people. Because I've never been to church where there's more men than women. So he just fed thousands of people. They're like, well, we want to see a miracle. He's like, <laughs> you know, he's like, healed all over the country in the land. We want to see a miracle. He says, I, he says, a wicked and adulterous in a generation looks for a sign. 
here's your son. This is the, Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and came out alive. So the son of man will be in the belly of the earth three days and come out alive. There's your son. There's one proof that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. He's alive. He rose from the dead. And that is typified in Jonah. Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5 2. And Messiah would be from everlasting, um, Micah 5 2. And notice that. We know it's going to be born of a virgin. We know it's going to be God in the flesh. And now we know his origins are from everlasting. So when I was created and knit together in my mother's room, he made me right then and there. My soul, my spirit, you know, was made. And then I was placed in this body in my mother's womb. Jesus' soul was not made right there. This child, this Messiah, who's going to be born, his origin, his spirit, his soul, is from everlasting. In other words, without beginning. He's the everlasting God. Um, you know, uh, Father of Eternity. That's who's going to be born of a woman, of a virgin. Um, he would uh, come after Assyria falls, Nahum taught us. The Messiah would come after, and that's the, the idea that Assyria would be destroyed. <laughs> Blew their minds. But the Babylonians come along and do it quite efficiently. Um, Messiah would come like the sun at his return, full of glory, in back 3 3. Typified the life of the fact his intercessory prayer for the people, the way Habakkuk made intercession, the Messiah would make intercession. So, uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and something got shrunk here, the teeny tiny. I don't think you're going to read that. <laughs> Can you see that in the back? No. I can't see it. I'm standing right here. Uh, I'll, get to, I'll, I'll read it to you here in a second. Uh, God will restore the remnant before Messiah comes. Uh, in Zephaniah. God, so, the people get all parted off. There's nobody left in the land. And the people that were left, they get drunk out of Egypt and die. So there's no one left. And God says, before Messiah comes, they'll all be back. How can that happen? How, how can he come back? In fact, uh, uh, Jeremiah even predicts that the guy who's going to send him back is some king named Cyrus. Turns out to be after. Um, Messiah would visit the second temple, Haggai 2. He prophesies that, hey, this temple of Messiah is going to come here. They, they rebuilt the temple and it wasn't as nice as Solomon. Solomon's was fancy. And so the people who never saw the old temple were rejoicing. Woo, got a temple! The people who were really old and seen the other one, they're like, oh, it's not as nice. The good old days were better. And the prophet Haggai comes and says, no, this temple is better than Solomon's. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm alive. He says, because this one is going to be visited by Messiah. And Jesus came to that temple. He was eight days old when he showed up. That's where they circumcised him. They offered sacrifice. Messiah would be uh, priests and kings. We talked about that earlier. And by the way, um, kings, the gift of kings was gold. And what would a priest use? To burn his incense. Frankincense, right? And then what would a prophet use to anoint people with? Oil, right? Myrrh. And when the Magi came and they gave the gifts, they were not random gifts. The gold, frankincense, and myrrh represented king, a priest, and a prophet. Prophet, priest, and king. And the very gifts they gave him indicated his ministry. Uh, Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Did that happen? Yes, it did. Messiah would be God, Zechariah. Yes, he was. Messiah would be Pierce. And Zechariah says that. And Psalm 22 says that. Isaiah 53 depicts his death. And, uh, and then this little tiny stuff down here. Messiah would appear in the temple, Malachi 3 1. And Messiah would be the forerunner, uh, would come in the spirit of Elijah. Let me do something here. I apologize, I don't know how that happened. So, let's see if I can. Messiah would appear at the temple uh, in Malachi and fulfill the mark. Messiah would be the forerunner would come in the spirit of Elijah. And of course, John the Baptist fulfills that. And so in all of the prophets, we see the coming Messiah again and again. The gospel is laid out for you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the details are foretold 
and you can go find it in the Old Testament. That's what's so powerful about it. And that's the word of the prophets made more certain. So God gives the prophecies to the people that encourages them in the day it's written. They didn't understand how exactly it would play out. The Bible says the angels didn't even understand. They longed to look into it. But he gives them a general idea. Kind of the way Revelation doesn't give us all the details, but he gives us a general idea of what's coming. And that's what it had. So we, what, ultimately, what do we know from the book of Revelation? God will. Evil is defeated, and his people are saved, and there's a judgment day, and righteous go to heaven, and wicked go to heaven. And they had a rough idea that Messiah was coming, and he was going to save the Gentiles. And he gave them pretty specific about when. Now, he doesn't tell us when. We don't know when. The when, um, Jesus says, is uh, secret. And it will come unexpectedly. First time, he did not come unexpectedly. He came right when he said he we don't know when he's coming back. This time. But last time he said when. He said where. He said how. He said who. He gave specific detail. And Jesus fulfilled 330 some of them. Now some people say 336. Some people say 333. I don't know. It depends on how you break down certain prophecies and you count them as one or two. 330 some is what I would say. Prophecies that Jesus fulfills in those prophets. And it's amazing. And so all along, God's honing down who it's be. You know how many of the prophecies of those 330 some prophecies I fulfill? One. <laughs> a male born woman. That's it. Nailed it. I'm not even close. <laughs> and no one today could be. We're past the time. We have no way to prove the lineage of anybody. There, there aren't any, we can't even prove that they're children of Abraham, much less the sins of David. Jesus came at the right time to the right parents in the right place. He grew up in the right circumstances, had to go to Egypt and come out of Egypt. Couldn't stay in Bethlehem where he was born and went to Judea. Um, I mean, one of the prophecies is that he'd be called the branch. Well, what, how is that fulfilled? Well, Nazareth means branch in Greek. The word Nazareth is a Greek word. It means branch. And every time they tried to insult him and infer that he was an illegitimate son called Jesus of Nazareth, all they were doing was fulfilling prophecy that says he was the branch. Jesus the branch. He was prophesied. He calls himself son of man. He calls himself the branch. They call him Emmanuel. He is God with us. His origins are from everlasting. It's God in the flesh. It's all predicted. The virgin birth. The divinity. Where he'd be born. How he'd be born. Who he'd be born to. What his enemies would say to him. His ministry. His life. His prophet, priest, and king. His, his Everything. Is foretold in the prophets. You, you can go back and find every important doctrine on who the person of Jesus is in the Old Testament. That's why Paul will go in and teach about Jesus from the Old Testament to the synagogue. He could prove that Jesus was the Christ from the law and prophets. Because it's all there. It's all there written for. So it was important to the people at the time because it gave them comfort and hope of the coming Messiah. But it's important to us in retrospect because now we see the Malachi, that's 400 years before Mary and Joseph. For 400 years, nothing. Not a word, not a prophet, nothing. Until God comes to uh, John the Baptist's dad in the temple. And then everything starts. John's born, and then uh, uh, this old man and this old lady who are prophets in the temple, they're told by God, you're going to see the coming Messiah. And then the prophets start. All of a sudden, now, now we got prophets. Now all of a sudden, we start to have uh, things happening. And then Jesus comes along with all his miracles. And it's just amazing. After 400 years. And why did God put that break in? To separate when the predictions were made from when the predictions were fulfilled. So that there's no way it could have been fake. The hundreds of years in advance, it's all laid out in truth. If that doesn't make you believe in Jesus Christ, I don't know what will. That's the proof. That's the evidence. That's how I know it's not a fun story that mommy and daddy taught me. 
This isn't any Santa Claus Easter Bunny baloney. This is the real deal. This is the truth. This is fact. This is history foretold by the prophets. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. 